Okay, so it's a great pleasure to give you this lecture now um, on the physics of football. Let me start out first by playing a little video clip, uh, which has been in part um, prepared by uh, through support by the National Science Foundation. thousand punts over a 16-year NFL career, Craig Hendrick knows down to his toes the secrets of a perfect punt. When you make contact with that ball, it's almost a feeling um, that you don't feel the ball in your foot. It's almost like you're swinging your leg in air um, when the ball comes off of there perfectly. Elite kickers like Hendrick have been known to launch a football 120 feet in the air at speeds of up to 90 miles per hour. These powerful punts are a perfect example of projectile motion. And the arc the ball makes as it slices through the air is something that has been studied by scientists for centuries. All the way back to Galileo Galilei, one of the great thinkers of the Renaissance. He's one of the first people in Western science to realize that the shape of that curve is something the mathematicians have been talking about for a couple of thousand years. It's called a parabola. To help us understand projectile motion and parabolas, we asked Hendrick to perform his craft in front of a super high-speed camera called a phantom cam. It all begins with the drop. And action. The ideal drop, uh, the ball has to stay level or with the nose or the front of the ball slightly up. At the moment of impact of the ball, our, our leg will actually snap uh, and actually straighten out at that moment, and that's the exact moment that you want to make contact with the ball. And up it goes, following a path and the laws of gravity. Once a punter kicks a football, it becomes what we call a projectile, and it follows a path that we would also call a parabolic arc or a parabola. As the football flies through the air in the shape of a parabola, there are two main components of velocity affecting the ball. It has a horizontal component, the speed it's traveling along the ground, and a vertical component, the speed it's moving vertically. These two velocity components, the vertical and the horizontal, can be represented as vectors. A vector is basically an arrow in two dimensions that describes some kind of physical quantity. In this case, vectors show the physical quantities of speed and direction. The greater the speed, the longer the velocity vector. As gravity tries to slow the ball down, the vertical velocity vector gets smaller. Gravity is acting on it from the instant that it leaves the player's foot, and but the effect of gravity is, is demonstrated by the fact that the speed of the ball is decreasing. Gravity eventually causes the football to stop rising and reach the top point of its trajectory. When it's at that high point, something very curious goes on. It has no up and down speed at all. And so the up and down speed of a ball at its maximum point of arc is zero. Our goal in punting is to get the ball to hang or hang in the air, to be in the air as long as possible. And then it begins to come down and the speed goes from zero and then it comes back down really fast. Gravity pulls the ball back down to earth. As it gains more speed, the vertical velocity vector now points downward. When it starts to come back down to the ground, the vertical component of velocity is in the opposite direction and the horizontal component is still the same. And down it goes until it reaches its mark. That was always a great feeling to get as a punter to watch that ball go in there knowing that you hit it perfectly. Parabolas come in all shapes and sizes, but it takes NFL punters like Frank Hendrick to turn science into an art form. All right, so after this little introductory video, let me give you an outline of the topics concerning the physics of football that I want to discuss. Um, <clears throat> so I first will go through some basics of, the, of a football's trajectory from throwing and kicking and give you an example directly related to the play of football, namely a downfield pass uh, in a punt. <clears throat> 
The second part I want to discuss are the bas basics of momentum conservation uh, in collisions. And there I'm going to discuss then a tackle, football tackle. Secondly, um, the um, next topic I want to discuss is the basics of impulse. Uh, and there I want, want to discuss uh, the relevance for helmet design. Uh, other effects that I'm going to address are the spiral, very quite important for having a good control of the football, and I will finish with a brief summary. So let's first begin by a discussion of the basics of a football's trajectory, namely the motion in two dimensions uh, of a football. And so what I'm drawing here now is a coordinate system. Um, so you see here the y-axis in units in yard, as a function of the x-axis in yards. And what I'm drawing here now is various examples, starting at the location um, of a football player throwing a football up in the air and various possibilities. Uh, and what distinguishes now these various trajectories? Well, what they all have in common uh, is the initial velocity, the total initial velocity. Uh, and this is quoted here in various units, 50 miles per hour, you can convert this in the kilometers per hour, which, which would be 80.5 kilometers per hour, or feet per second, 73.3 feet per second, or meters per second, 22.4, or last but not least, um, in yards per second, 24.4. So this is a common quantity for all of these trajectories, but what distinguishes them now? Well, it's the initial angle. In the first case in orange, the initial angle would be 10 degrees, 25 degrees. And then in black here, we have 45 degrees, right in between. Um, and then we have here 65 degrees uh, in blue uh, in a very large angle, uh, initial angle uh, at 80 degrees. So the initial conditions of throwing a football are given by two quantities. Number one, the initial total velocity number one, and number two, the initial angle. Um, and the, uh, the motion of a football can be then decomposed uh, into an in two independent motions along in the horizontal direction and the vertical direction. As you probably still know from your high school education, you can decompose this total initial velocity into a component in the horizontal and in the vertical direction using very basic trigonometry. So meaning the X component here would be V naught, the length of the velocity arrow here, velocity vector times the cosine of this angle. And in the vertical um, direction, it would be V naught times the sine of this angle, opposite uh, and adjacent. So now we have two independent overlapping motions. In the horizontal direction, this is where the acceleration is zero. Nobody is pulling uh, on that football in the horizontal direction, so the, the velocity remains always a constant. Uh, and the underlying basic equations is now as follows. So the acceleration is zero. Acceleration quantifies the rate of change of velocity. If that is actually zero, so therefore the velocity has to be a constant. And it is a constant throughout the entire motion of this fo uh, football. And it's given simply by the component relative to the initial total velocity. So V naught times cosine theta. And if the velocity is a constant and velocity quantifies the rate of change of displacement in time, then the actual displacement, the location varies just linearly in time. V naught cosine theta times T. So what about now the vertical direction? Well, in the vertical directions, somebody is pulling uh, on that football, uh, namely downward, due to the gravitational attraction from the Earth. There's a constant acceleration due to the gravitational attraction, and the amount is, to be more precise, 9.81 meters uh, per second squared. Um, and you see here now quoted to the various underlying basic equations. So the acceleration is a constant downward. That's why you have here a negative sign. Uh, therefore, the velocity varies linear in time, the initial velocity minus gt. Uh, and g by itself is a positive number. And what you notice here, there's a minus sign. So at t equals to zero at, uh, in the in initial location here, the uh, vertical component is given uh, simply by basic trigonometry as v naught times sine theta naught. But as time advances, 
you're subtracting something here now. And eventually that will become zero. And this is exactly at the highest point what you heard before uh, in this little video. So there is no up and down velocity in the vertical direction of velocity is zero. Um, and then here's now the, um, the actual trajectory, the function of time. Uh, why is a function of time? You have a, a term linear in time and a term quadratic in time. For now, we co completely ignore uh, the impact uh, of air resistance. And then what you now can do is you can eliminate time in here in the, uh, in the y uh, as a function of time equation and come to the, the, the actual trajectory. And this is what is plotted here now, y as a function of x for a certain initial angle uh, and for a certain uh, initial velocity. Those are the initial conditions. G, the gravitational uh, um, uh, acceleration constant uh, is a constant value uh, here on the Earth. So let me now continue the discussion about basics of football and discuss various characteristic quantity uh, of the motion of a, um, of, a, uh, of a football, namely the rise time, the hang time, the peak time, and the overall range. So let me come back to this graph, what you just have seen before here, um, distinguishing different angles, 10, 25, 45 degrees, 65 degrees, uh, and 80 degrees. The rise time is exactly given by that point where the, uh, where the vertical component of velocity reaches a zero value. This is exactly the rise time. So you can easily uh, obtain this number using the very basic equation what I just have shown you before, setting the vertical component to, to zero. The hang time is simply twice the rise time. So it takes as long uh, uh, to go up uh, as, the, as it go out coming back down. So, so the hang time is two times the rise time. And what you now can do is you can eliminate this term here and formulate this entirely in terms of the overall height here. And what you notice here that the hang time is entirely determined uh, by the height, um, the maximum height uh, of the football's trajectory. The peak height is now given here. And last but not least, the range. And now you notice something peculiar here. The range, for example, shown here for 10 degrees has the same range as it also have for 80 degrees. Or well, the range here at 25 degrees has the same range as 60, uh, 65 degrees. And this is a peculiar pr uh, property of this term, the sine of two times the angle, uh, because angles which add up to 90 degrees have the same value of sine of that two times of that angle. Uh, so in this case, 10 plus 80 degrees adds up to 90, 25 and 65 add up to uh, uh, 90 degrees. So in both cases, the sine of two times of the respective angles uh, is identical. There's another thing what you notice here. Uh, for 45 degrees, you reach the largest range here. So this is two takeaway messages what I want to tell you here right now. The hang time here, what you have also heard before, uh, in this little introductory uh, video is entirely determined by the maximum height of the football's trajectory, number one. Number two, the range is maximized if you're kicking that football uh, under 45 degrees. What you can also do here is you can tune the amount of time that football is in the air by uh, throwing this football under different angles, for example, if you want to increase the time that the football is up in the air, you go from 45 degrees to 65 degrees. Therefore, the total time in the air goes from 3.2 to 4.1 seconds uh, with those initial conditions for the uh, uh, initial velocity. So let me show you an example here now. Let's begin first with a horizontal throw, something very simple first here. So you again see here y is a function of x here. Um, and imagine a football uh, player wants to throw this football in the horizontal direction. Uh, so there is the, the uh, um, initial vertical component of the velocity is simply zero. And you only have an initial ho uh, horizontal component. So imagine we're considering here a downfield pass to a wide receiver from the third uh, uh, yard line, namely from here to the 11th yard line. 
And imagine this would take about 0.33 seconds. These numerical values have been extracted from an actual football game. Um, and then uh, with, the, with these numbers, we obtain then a velocity in the horizontal direction, which is a constant because there's no acceleration in the horizontal direction of 22 meters per second or 24 uh, yards per second. So what is the vertical position of the football at the location of the wide receiver? So now what is actually that vertical location here? So the initial location would be the height of that football player. Let's say this is six feet. But what is now the, uh, this location here afterwards? Well, we're, we can also calculate that. So the initial location here would be six feet, meaning the height of a football player. Uh, in the vertical direction, the uh, velocity initially is zero. So this term is zero. So we I end up only with subtracting the third last term here minus a half, the uh, gravitational acceleration constant now calculated in feet per second squared and times the time, 0.33 uh, to the power of two. So in this case here, we would end up here with 4.3 feet. So clearly smaller than initially on six feet here. So this is quite powerful. Um, another thing which we're able to do is what is the angle of the football relative to the horizontal direction here? So meaning this angle here. And we obtain this angle by the ratios um, of the respective velocities here. Um, so the vertical uh, velocity component um, after that time 0.33 seconds, uh, when you throw this uh, foot at this downfield pass to a wide receiver would be now as follows. The initial velocity is zero. So you have only this term minus GT. We know G, this is minus, uh, this is 32 feet per second squared and the time is 0.33 seconds. So we then are able to calculate the vertical component of the velocity. The horizontal component, we do have that already anyhow. Um, that happens to be the, um, uh, 72 feet per second versus the vertical component of minus 3.5 feet per second. The minus sign simply takes care of that it's going downward here. And with these two, they're using very basic trigonometry, we can calculate this angle here, namely as the inverse of the tangent of the vertical to the horizontal component, which turns out to be here 2.8 degrees. Let me show you now here the example of a punt. So let's go back to our uh, trajectories for throwing a football under different angles for an initial velocity here. Let me call this uh, in, in feet, 73.3 feet uh, per second. And what I have compiled here now is a table um, of the hang time, the height and the range for different angles. Uh, and what you see here, the hang time, the, again, the hang time is the total time that football is up in the air. For example, under 45 degrees, uh, that football is for a total time of 3.2 seconds uh, up in the air here. Uh, and you notice here, the hang time is entirely determined by the height. So with increasing, uh, with increasing um, height, uh, the uh, hang time uh, is also increasing here. The range here is entirely determined by the, the uh, actually angle for a fixed uh, initial velocity. And you receive the maximum value under 45 degrees here. That's a property of the sine of two times the angle. And what you also notice here for angles which are add up to 90 degrees, like 10 and 80, you get the same range, namely 19 yards. And for 25 and 65 degrees, which also add up to 90 degrees, you get the same range, namely 43 yards. So the, so the strategy, which I've mentioned also before, is to adjust the launch angle to maximize the time for the rusher, which, for example, runs with 10 yards per second, getting the, to, uh, the downfield to catch up uh, and attempt to, uh, to tackle the returner. So under 45 degrees, the horizontal distance would be 32 yards, whereas under 65 degrees, uh, the hang time is simply larger here and you, have, uh, you are here at a 41 uh, yards and you're able to catch up to that. You would not be able to do that um, if, the, um, if you reduce the hang time because you're throwing it under a smaller angle. So let's come now to a, um, a second class of topics which is super important uh, in the game of football, namely the basics of momentum conservation and collisions.
let's first talk about some very basic aspect of momentum and momentum conservation. So how is momentum defined? Well, momentum, uh, as Newton calls it, is the, the, the quantity of motion is the product of mass times velocity. Ve velocity is a vectorial quantity. So the direction of the velocity is inherited to the momentum. So momentum is a vectorial quantity. Momentum vector equals to mass times the velocity vector. Now, what's the uh, connection between force uh, and momentum or rather momentum change? Force is nothing else as the rate of change of momentum in time, changing momentum divided by delta T. And you can write here the, the change momentum as the difference between a final uh, and an initial quantity. Let me show you now something uh, very interesting. Namely, out of third Newton law, you can actually derive so-called momentum conservation. Third Newton law states, if you exert a force of one object on another object, the other object exerts the same force on you, same in magnitude, but opposite in direction. Imagine these two football players, I label him as one here and the other uh, football player uh, here and two here. Um, so football player, um, uh, one here experiencing a force onto that football player one from two and football player uh, two experiencing a force F to one from a uh, football player one onto two. They're the same in magnitude, same length of these vectors, but they are acting uh, in the opposite direction. And this is purely a consequence out of third Newton law, how objects interact with each other when once they are in contact. So we can formulate this mathematically in the following way. F12 equals to minus F21. And imagine these two football players are engaging in a tackle here, and that occurs over a little time interval delta T here. And we're ignoring any other forces uh, around that, only these two very large forces, so-called contact forces. But force times the time interval is nothing else than the momentum change. So you have here, therefore, the change momentum of football player one equals to the negative of the change of momentum of football player two here. And the change in momentum is the difference between the final and initial value as it's shown here, my, uh, equals to minus the respective difference, but now for football player two. And you can easily rearrange this, bring all initial quantities on the left-hand side and all fi final quantities on the right-hand side. And look what we have now uncovered. The initial momentum of football player one plus the initial momentum of football player two equals to the sum of the respective quantities in the final state. So meaning the total momentum before and after is the same. That's in the true sense momentum is, uh, is conserved. Um, so let's talk about now collisions. There, we, one classifies uh, two types of collisions. Before I do that, I want to introduce one important quantity which captures and quantifies the level of energy of motion, so-called kinetic energy. It's given here by this little formula, half times the mass times the velocity of the object squared. Um, elastic collisions are those types of collisions. Uh, and this is symbolized here in this little view graph here. Imagine you have a billiard ball coming in with a certain momentum, uh, striking a billiard ball uh, at rest here. So that billiard ball is moving, that initial billiard ball is at rest. So what elastic collisions now uh, capture is that the sum of kinetic energy before and after the collision is the same. Um, so meaning the uh, kinetic energy of these two objects before is equals to the kinetic energy um, uh, of the two objects afterwards. So here before uh, and here afterwards. In the inelastic case, as part of the collision, you're losing something, namely the conversion, not the destruction, the conversion of energy of motion in other forms of energy, for example, deformation uh, or heat. And therefore the total sum of the kinetic energy before is larger than the kinetic energy uh, in the final state. So now let's talk here about a tackle, uh, a numerical example uh, of a tackle here. Imagine uh, two football players encounter engaging in an inelastic collision. So the football player one, let's say, has 80 kilograms in mass and is moving 4.1 meters per second, meaning to the right. 
football player two who has 91 uh, kilograms is moving to the left. That's keeping track of this minus sign, minus seven meters per second. The final velocity we can calculate now using momentum of conservation is minus 1.8 meters per second. So both of them, while in this part of this tackle, are moving somewhat to the left. Now let's compare the energy of the motion, the kinetic energy, before and after the collision. Before, well, it's the kinetic energy of player one, 80 kilograms and 4.1 meters per second. Um, and the kinetic energy of player two gives you 2,902 joule. After the collision, they're moving as one combined object with a common velocity, we have only 277. So you lost a huge amount namely 2,625 Joule. Where did that go? Well, first of all, let me compare this to give you a sense for how much energy that is. That's the energy to power a 60 watt light bulb, which you all have at home for about 45 seconds. So quite a bit. Um, in this energy, it's not lost. Energy is uh, uh, concerned, uh, uh, covered uh, in other forms of energy. In this word, the conversion to heat uh, and deformation. So let me come now to the third part, uh, the basics uh, of impulse. Um, the impulse is another form of really capturing the true sense uh, of momentum change. Uh, impulse is another uh, formulation of quantifying uh, of momentum change as part of a collision. Um, if um, in you, so momentum change is equals there for the force times occurring over a certain time interval. If that force is a constant, you simply multiply that force times that time interval. If, however, that force is changing throughout that collision process, then using very basic aspects of calculus, you evaluate an integral of the force vector uh, to over a time interval. And let me also um, give you an intuition uh, into that. Namely, what role does the time interval delta t play? Imagine the following. When you, you guys are jumping up in the air, uh, you initially at an instant in time come to rest. Then you're moving back down and just you converting potential gravitational potential energy into energy of motion. And just before you hit the ground, you have a very large downward momentum. Then you're colliding with the ground and your momentum after the collision is zero. So you have a fairly sizable momentum change. So momentum change is now force times delta t. Well, force on what? Well, force on your body, on your knees. So imagine now the following. It's best to land with your knees bent so that your legs can fl uh, flex. Now imagine this time interval is large uh, for the same momentum change, same momentum change, uh, imagine that time interval is large. Therefore, you can afford that this, uh, the force on your knees is actually small. If you do not flex your knees, meaning delta T is small, then the force is actually very large uh, and you, you can, can cause some injuries. So what is the relevance now for uh, playing football? Well, this directly really drives the, the helmet design. You see here a very famous example of a helmet, Xenet X2 helmet. Uh, with various cushion, uh, cushioning elements uh, inside of that helmet. The role of the cushioning is really to reduce the impact of these large forces. You make delta T large for a given momentum change and you reduce that force. Uh, in the NFL, helmet to helmet hits are banned and, and lead to a penalty of 15 yards uh, are given for violation of that. The last topic uh, is one of the most challenging topics in playing football, uh, the spiral and also the, the relevance uh, of air resistance. And I simply want to briefly mention this here. Um, how much resistance an object uh, experiencing while uh, flying through air is given by the so-called drag force. It is dependent on the effective area uh, of the object while flying through air. And you see here different shape examples here. Uh, the density uh, of the medium here, in this case, air, the velocity object, and last but not least, a coefficient which characterizes the shape. You see here, for example, a streamlined object has a, a drag coefficient of only 0.04.
in contrast to, for example, a cube here has a drag coefficient of 1.05. I mean, these uh, aspects play a hugely important role, for example, in the design of cars. Turns out that this uh, drag coefficient here, plotted here on the y-axis, as a function of the baseball uh, uh, speed, uh, or rather football speed, um, uh, is depending on that. And you see here now, and uh, depending on what, namely, you have here a football which is non-spiraling around the long axis, whereas here the case where the football is actually spiraling at a rate of 600 uh, rate per minute around the long axis. And you can re reduce the level of uh, that drag coefficient, number one, it is velocity dependent, and you can reduce it somewhat in particular at lower velocities. Air resistance in the spiral football are clearly very complicated phenomena. Uh, putting a spiral on the ball allows a much greater accuracy uh, because the fly pack is, uh, is more predictable. And this is one of the key uh, talents uh, for example, for quarterback to, uh, to put a spiral uh, on a football when, uh, when it throws it. But this is one of the more challenging parts also um, in, in, in mechanics and physics to really de uh, describe this. So in summary, the takeaway message is the following. For a given initial velocity, the maximum range is achieved if you launch that football under an angle of 45 degrees. The hang time or total flight time is determined solely by its peak height and is independent of the horizontal velocity component. A tackle involves inelastic collisions during which kinetic energy is converted to heat uh, and deformation. A helmet protects by spreading the force both in space and time by its, uh, its padding. Air resistance leads to an effective smaller, uh, smaller range. A spiral helps to control uh, a thrown football. Clearly, there's a lot of physics at play uh, in various elements um, of football. So thank you so much uh, for your attention.